So one of the questions that I get asked most frequently is how I can stand to work on such a lost cause as saving the world's fish. So more than 80% of the world's fisheries are currently fished at maximum capacity or they're overfished, and we're losing a lot of battles. The depleted New England cod fishery was declared a national disaster this year, and bluefin tuna is working its way toward extinction. We've only had the money and the scientific capacity to actually measure about a third of the world's fisheries. So there's thousands of fisheries out there that we actually have no idea what's happening. They're mysterious. And the news probably isn't good. We're looking at a lot of jellyfish in the future. So if you like to succeed at work, if you are wired to win, then fish might look like a bad way to invest your time. If you're a foundation that's interested in good performance metrics, fish might look like a bad way to spend your money. And if you're a consumer looking for a feel-good, I made a difference moment, then fish is really easy to walk away from. And that's troubling, because more and more of our problems today look like so-called wicked problems. They're hard to solve, and they don't resolve easily with those take the hill, win that war strategy for short term. I don't believe in lost causes. I think how we hold our problems determines our ability to address them. Whether we are overwhelmed or hopeless or apathetic actually matters collectively. Making change in the world is not about just coming up with different solutions to problems. It's about a new way of being with problems in relationship to them. So how do we take on challenges that we know are lost causes? Well, I'd say it starts with questioning what we think we know. Today, I'm going to make the case for uncertainty. I believe in no lost causes. I believe that uncertainty is incredibly powerful. It's the basis for hope. It's in many cases more important than knowledge. It's the reason that I don't believe in lost causes. And I learned that because I used to think that I was one. Today, I'm going to tell a personal story about my journey to understanding the power of uncertainty. And this is not going to be a pretty story. I'm telling it because Saul invited us to go deep, because I also believe that this audience has the capacity to hear it and not just listen. And I'm telling it because you and I need to talk. We as a community of innovators need to have a conversation about where we find the resilience and the tenacity to work on problems that seem impossible, that other people walk away from. And we have to figure out a way to pass that on to more people. So here I go. When I was a teenager, I was raped. That event is unremarkable, statistically speaking. My case is actually a textbook example of the most common kind of assault. I knew my assailant, who was a boy I was dating. I thought I was in love. I never reported it. And my rapist is today a successful lawyer. TV dramas like to resolve rape episodes in one or two sessions with the victim going back to normal life after a few commercial breaks. And that was not my experience. I developed and I still have chronic post-traumatic stress disorder more than 20 years after my assault. PTSD is more familiarly talked about in the context of combat veterans. And for a veteran, it might be that a backfiring car causes a flashback to the gunfire and to the explosions of the battlefield. For survivors of rape, the battlefield is intimacy. I can't speak for all survivors, but for me, the hardest part has not been the chronic nightmares or the anxiety I feel in crowds or on the subway or the obsessive safety planning I do for every business trip. It is that every first kiss has been stained by fear. 
It is that sex, which is supposed to be something about connection and desire and love, can in one flashback turn into a reliving of terror and violence. Flashbacks aren't about me thinking that every guy that I meet is a rapist. PTSD doesn't live in the conscious part of your brain. It lives in the place where autonomous responses and survival instincts are, are held. Scientists are still decoding the complex process by which we take memory and store it in different places and recall it. I'm not a neuroscientist, so I won't get into the theories here, but my lived experience of this phenomenon is that when that survival piece of my brain is triggered, it kicks up emotions or flashbacks or panic attacks as a way to try to keep me safe. I call this part of my brain little animal because it's been a way for me to develop some compassion around this idea that there's this part of me that I can't control that can hijack my consciousness. That's one of the reasons why the question, why aren't you over this yet, is so profoundly ignorant. I got over being raped a long time ago. I've been through therapy, I've dealt with the guilt and the anger and the shame. Little animal has been a little more stubborn. When I first started dating after the assault, about five years after it happened, um, there wasn't much out there about PTSD. The medical community had just started to talk about it as an issue for rape victims. So as you would imagine, my dating experience went pretty poorly. My first boyfriend after the assault got an unedited version of the flashbacks and the nightmares and my reactions to them. It wasn't easy for either of us. I think the only thing worse than interrupting sex to shake and cry in the corner over a flashback is to feel that you might have caused that in the person that you love. I was not equipped to explain my landscape to him or even understand it myself. We broke up about two years afterwards, when we first met, for a lot of reasons. But the one he focused on in the letter he sent me was that I was damaged. And he told me that if I didn't figure out a way to fix that, no one would ever want to be with me. And I believed him. So as I move forward, I tried lots of different kinds of therapy. Group therapy, drug therapy, talk therapy, and none of it worked. And in 2009, I kind of came to the conclusion that all this work hadn't really gotten me anywhere. My belief that I could cure my PTSD seemed not only naive, but just simply wrong. I looked at my past experiences that had been reinforced by lots of men who had stopped calling or disappeared when the PTSD surfaced, and the lingering effects that I seemed to not be able to control. And it seemed pretty clear that I was headed for failure. And at that point, I kind of crumbled inside. I felt like I had to accept this dismal future that this just might be as good as it gets. And for me, that was not a version of life that I wanted to live. It was around that time that I launched Future of Fish, which was our first initiative for Flip Labs, taking on this problem of trying to save the fish in the ocean. And strangely, in this new world of fish, I felt this secret kinship with the marine scientists I were meeting, all of whom seemed to carry this deep, deep sense of despair over the state of the world. They felt like their research was merely chronicling the obituary for the ocean. At the time, I thought, why not take on something impossible? Because I have nothing to lose. But I had only grim determination to offer. About two years into that depression, I had a breakthrough. After lots of failed therapies, I ended up, through my meditation practice, 
finding a spiritual advisor that I trusted. And I brought my dilemma to him. I said, I think I have to make peace with the, the way things are, and that it's not going to get any better. And he said, Cheryl, acceptance is a present tense activity. You can't accept something in the future because it hasn't happened yet. It's just an idea. No one can predict what's going to happen. Acceptance is a present tense activity. <laughs> and in that moment, I could suddenly see this whole narrative that I'd built around the future that was based on my fear and the past. All of a sudden, I could see that I didn't actually even have to hope that things would get better. I didn't have to know how. I just had to know that I didn't know. And that gave me enough space to breathe. As I started to absorb that insight, I started to do things differently. I wrote out a script for how I wanted to talk about PTSD with a potential partner. And I committed to doing it and having that conversation on or before the third date. It was excruciating. It meant front-loading all of this vulnerable sharing into the part of a relationship that where it's most vulnerable. And most of those conversations went badly. <laughs> but I was okay with that. Because I knew that if I couldn't find a guy who could react well, it wasn't the guy I was looking for. And instead of being ashamed, I felt a little bit of hope that I was finding, bit by bit, a way to tell my own story. I was finding a way to speak my truth. That truth started to come into my work life as well in my conversations with marine scientists. And suddenly I could see that all of them were isolated from other disciplines like business and technology and storytelling. And perhaps if they had some more exposure to that, they might be able to see a future that looked something like unlike certain defeat. I started to talk about the power of the entrepreneurs that I was recruiting for Future Fish and their ability to potentially make a different path and a different future. <clears throat> and about three years later, I went out on another third date, not so unlike some of the other third dates that I'd been on before. And I started my spiel, which by that point was a little bit more practiced, although it always started I was raped a long time ago, and I still have PTSD. And his two-word response was, me too. I didn't get fixed. The path didn't change. But the way that I made my journey after that was transformed and certainly not the way that I had ever thought it would be. So what does this have to do with saving the ocean? Or stopping climate change? Or ending human trafficking? Well, let me show you what happens when you don't believe that our future is a fishless ocean. You start to find people like this. This is Barton Seaver. Barton is a chef and an amazing storyteller. And what we've worked on doing is creating a platform for him where his message goes out to millions of people and to thousands of folks who transact in the supply chain. In the time that we've worked with him, he's become a lecturer at Harvard, a best-selling author, and he's developed a training program for chefs that teaches them how to use sustainable fish, unfamiliar species, and cook delicious and profitable meals and that training is rolling out to 40 cities within the next three years. This is Bren Smith. He used to be a fisher of the worst sort, exploiting the ocean with some of, its worst, some of the worst practices out there. Today, Bren is a farmer. He farms oysters and kelp, which helps mitigate climate change. We're working with him to start a nonprofit that will replicate his farming model from New England to Thailand. 
His kelp noodles sell in Whole Foods already. And his mantra is, kelp is the new kale. <laughs> I have 25 more of these stories working on the world of fish. We have a theory of change. We have a, a specific set of anthropological insights and business criteria that we use to select our system levers and choose our entrepreneurs. But underneath that, the core of our work is this. We stand in the doorway as the certainty, the heaviness of it, is shutting. And we put our foot in the way. And we stand and hold that door open so folks like Bren and Barton can walk through. We put our faith not in the cause and effect predictions, but in the work of deepening the capacity of the system to heal itself. And that means finding innovators like this and supporting them both as individuals and in tribes so that they can take on unimaginable risk to make change in the world. No one can predict the ferocity of the human heart. No one can predict the limits of genius and invention. And no one can tell me that among these entrepreneurs that we've gathered that there isn't a beautiful black swan who's going to reinvent the future. So I would ask you, are there problems in your own life or in the world that you've given up on? Do you know that the future is going to be bleak? If so, I would, join, I would invite you to join us, the uncertain, and stand in the doorway with us and become a warrior for what might be. Because better answers are out there that we could never have imagined if we look back on our wounded world and say, me too. Thank you.